Welcome to Learn to Live Stress-Free. This is Christine Wright with Dr. Robert Wright, Jr., your go-to wellness coaches of www.stressfreenow.info. Our featured guest today is Dr. Woody Johnson, speaking on how to eliminate the fear of success, resistance, and self-sabotage that keeps you stuck. Dr. M. Woodruff Johnson has actively and successfully traded stock options, forex, and futures since 2000. He is the former executive director of the Kaiser Permanente Watts Counseling and Learning Center. He holds certifications in accelerated learning, neurosensory development, and hypnotherapy, and he is a certified NLP master practitioner. Dr. Woody is also an associate professor and teaches graduate psychology courses at Pacific Oaks College and Ryokan College. He has provided clinical staff services in hospitals and community clinics as well. He has a passion for helping others to achieve their goals and get the results in trading and life that they desire. Dr. Woody has been using mind-body healing techniques both professionally and personally with much success for many years. He is the author of From Pain to Profit, Secrets of the Peak Performance Trader. Hello, listeners. Welcome, Dr. Woody. Well, thank you so much, Christine and Bob. It's great to be here. Yes, Dr. Woody, it is an honor and a privilege to have you on as our featured guest. And audience, you are in for a treat. We, Dr. Woody is in the house. So, you know, Dr. Woody, I have to ask you this. Your bio tells our audience that you have a broad and deep range of skill sets, including psychology, counseling, coaching, accelerated learning, and neurolinguistic programming, otherwise known as NLP. Would you begin our interview today by defining and explaining to our audience what accelerated learning and NLP are and how they are used both inside and outside of the trading context? Well, that's a that's a mouthful, but uh, accelerated learning is really optimizing your resources with regard to your how your brain works and how your mind works. Now, the conventional wisdom for at least my bias and many of the colleagues that I work with accept the notion that there is a difference between mind and brain, although not everybody believes that. Some people believe that the brain holds all of it and Without the brain, there you know there is no mind, and this notion of collective consciousness and things like that are all just that notions. But I believe that the, the mind does not exist in the brain. In fact, the, the mind is ex, an extension of ourselves and is somewhat spiritual in nature, but it has an ability to supersede just the organics of the brain. But but that's, you know, that's a conversation for another time. So in terms of accelerated learning, it's, it's identifying and and using the Howard, Howard Gardner's uh, notion that we don't have only one intelligence. We have a number of intelligence. In fact, when you look at how IQ is used these days and, and how it has been used over the over the years, it is somewhat singular in the type of of knowledge or the type of uh, brain processing that that we all use. But it is only that way of using it. it, it in other words, uh, linguistics is one way of looking at things. And Howard Gardner talked about uh, his. There are eight different types, you know, to include spatial, uh, music, uh, physiological, and others. So accelerated learning is just using and identifying your resources from a number of different standpoints so that we optimize and actualize our abilities from an accelerated uh, standpoint. Now, neuro linguistic programming is quite simply. When you look at it, break it down. Neuro talks about uh, refers to the brain. Linguistic refers to language. Programming refers to how we are conditioned as we grow up, and from childhood into adulthood, and how that programming, uh, it, whether it's solid, good, positive programming, whether it's 
negative programming influences everything that we do. So it's a way of using the brain and the different techniques to, again, in the same way that accelerated learning does in some, in some standpoints, optimize those resources so that we can begin to reprogram ourselves and to, to deal with emerging patterns of thinking, feeling, and doing that get in our way. So this dual linguistic programming are tools and techniques and concepts that are designed to support the individual in identifying where they are having issues and then addressing them through ways that support the reprogramming of the system. Well, great, Woody. Thank you for that answer. And I have to tell you, um, as you said, I, I, I was so excited when I knew you were coming on the show. You know, my wife, Christine, said, oh, you know, we got Dr. Woody. And I said, um, and by your answer, I just have to tell you, uh, you, you know, we did a podcast with uh, Dr. Alan Combs on consciousness. And so when you were talking about the accelerating a uh, learning aspect, I was thinking, oh, that's a topic in and of itself. And then the NLP, um, and then when you mentioned Howard Gardner's work, I, it made me think of the book Super Learning and, and all the things that came out of that with the, uh, you know, using music and data learning, et cetera. And so I wanted to just say to you that I, at some future time, I, um, I'm hopeful that you will be able to regale our audience at another podcast where we would just discuss accelerated learning and NLP. And I think that would be very exciting to use real-world examples uh, for those two things. Things, and thank you for that answer. I, I, I totally, that would be great. And the thing is, um, my introduction to accelerated learning was through uh, the work of Sheila Ostrander and her colleague, and I'm forgetting her, her colleague's name right now, but they wrote the book Super Learning, and then they wrote another book uh, as a, and, and an, another edition of that. And, and another one is Barbara, uh, I forgot her name, Barbara, it'll come to me in a minute. And they talked about the work of Grigory Lazanov, and, and, uh, who was a Bulgarian scientist who worked with children and used uh, the uh, Baroque music, Adagio, yeah. which is six deep permitted music, that the, the body begins to entrain to it in a frequency following response. Yes. And these types of things are what they began with were some of the underpinnings of what was then termed accelerated learning later on. So they called it super learning. And then uh, Colin, uh, oh, Colin Rose. Colin Rose created the U.K. version of accelerated learning, and, and, they, and now they've done a lot of different uh, new things with that as well. So it's, it's, it's quite fascinating, and it's really uh, powerful. It is very powerful. Thank you so much, Woody. I'm certain that those in our audience who are familiar with this will really feel that they're in the right place at the right time listening to this interview. Woody, in your weekly column for the Online Trading Academy, you write articles describing the pitfalls of poor trading habits. And then you focus on how specific NLP practices can be beneficial for eliminating or changing detrimental habits. Would you share with us how and why NLP techniques can help traders and the general layperson eliminate and correct poor trading and other undesirable habits? Well, it all boils down to, the, the first of all, the fact that good trading has as its foundation the market knowledge, having a plan, a macro plan, first of all, which is a... Um, a plan for how, what, when, where, and why you're going to trade, which is the big picture. And then a micro plan, which is a plan for each and every trade. And you've got to have rules that are designed to support you in that process. So market knowledge, having a set of, of, of planning process, macro and micro plan, and a set of rules, a position sizing, and as well, the, the discipline it takes to make sure that you're following through and to keep all of your commitments. So with that, 
NLP is, the, as I was saying before, is designed to support an individual in, first of all, identifying what their issues are, and secondly, beginning to negotiate the process of, after they've identified emerging patterns that don't work for them, to then shift into supportive states that will help them to not only, after they've identified, to, in, to address them, but to then, through mental training, begin the process of step-by-step step to develop the, through creating consistency in how they are dealing with the issue, to develop capacity for emotional strength and endurance in the trade. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, Woody, um, although more, most people are familiar with the concept of the fear of the failure, or they at least have heard of it before, uh, in my view, in our view, I should say, the fear of success may loom even larger as a form of resistance blocking our path to stellar outcomes. Can you explain to our audience exactly what the fear of success is and how it impacts uh, training results? and then also how it can potentially negatively affect almost every aspect of, of, of goal attainment uh, or at least slow down the accomplishment of goal attainment. But uh, what I'm really getting at is the, big, the biggest question is, why would we fear success since that seems counterintuitive? Well, and that is counterintuitive, actually. But when we look at fear of success, it is a flip side of the fear of failure. And, you know, um, Fritz Kunkel talked about the four fatal fears, you know, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of emotional uh, discomfort, and the fear of being wrong, and that they all have needs associated with them. But when we look at the fear of success, oh, and by the way, what these fears are, they are for fatal not to your life, of course, but fatal to what you want your life to mean when it's all over. And they create survival mode thinking that really is antithetical to following through and doing things in a way that's going to be supporting you and getting the results that you want in life or in your trading, for instance. So that fear is, is false evidence appearing real, false evidence appearing real. Now, an example of survival mode thinking is, say, you know, you probably know some people right now. Maybe you do this. You sing in the shower, and I don't, but <laughs> a lot of people do. <laughs> but the thing is, if some people sing in the shower and really love to sing, but would rather have a poke in the eye with a sharp stick than to sing in public, then they've experienced survival mode thinking. But because survival mode thinking is thinking that has been uh, redirected from being supported by uh, things and thinking that is going to put you in the direction of getting the results that you want and getting and, and doing things that are um, challenging to remaining in the comfort zone. Of course, there's no growth in the comfort zone. So, what do you? I I want to just cut in here. Can 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 you say that again? What is it about? Because um, I want for our audience. I want this to be really clear. What is it about, what would be wrong about, in terms of goal attainment, uh, singing in the shower, how does that undercut and make that survival thinking? I think you've uh, hit the nail on the head if you can uh, <laughs> give us that because cause I, I think that it's really survival thinking and behaviors and that we don't often realize that there, it's a form of self-sabotage. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Survival mode thinking is that when you, say, for instance, let's use that example, singing in the shower. When you have identified something that you want, you begin to be, believe that you need it to survive. For instance, say Jack has a, a, a job, a good job, good paying job, and he's an executive. I'll get back to the singing example in a minute. But... With that job, he, his identity is tied to that job. If Jack loses that job, he's devastated. And it's not the, the job that is so uh, caught up in his thinking. It's his meaning for what that job has. And so when he loses the job and Jack 
feels that his life is over because his identity was tied to that job. So that's why he's devastated. He can't get beyond it. That's survival mode thinking. So that he thought he needed to have that job. And if we come into a situation, and to go back to the example of singing in the shower, we, if we feel we need something to survive and we don't get it, that's catastrophic thinking so that we feel that we will reject it, we'll lose. And deep down, the unconscious pain is acute, and it feels like you're going to die. So now people don't relate that intellectually, but that's the way they feel. That's the way Jack felt when, when he lost the job. Rather than saying, okay, this is a great job, but I had all of my resources going into this, my internal resources, I have them going out of it so I can find another job. But he, he, if he remains devastated, then he's, he is, is caught up in survival mode thinking. So survival mode thinking is what keeps the person from venturing out and doing something that challenges them and puts them at risk because they, they're afraid that if they don't uh, stay in the comfort zone, that they'll put themselves in the position and the pain will be so bad that they'll feel like they'll die. So they, they'll avoid that challenge at all costs. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think right there, you, what you said right at the end, the bullseye, you said, so they're singing in the shower because the real action is going out on auditions or, or, or applying or, or putting out a tape and then having the possibility that trolls come out on the Internet and say, oh, that song was horrible, right? Or that right. that song was great and now do another one. You know, we had a, a podcast with a gentleman, and he told a story about his family dynamic, which he said, you know, in, in his household, he said when he came home, and he got a, nine, a 97 on a test. His father didn't say to him, oh, great job. He goes, what happened to the other 3%, <laughs> right? right? So, right, exactly. so exactly. that kind of thing. And then when he got the, the 100, then there was never the pat on the back. And then it was always the pressure that you got to get 100 every time. So now you got the internal pressure at home uh, and then – how how happy are going to be all the kids in his school? But, hey, there's that guy. He gets 100 every time, right? So he told us he settled for the mediocrity, which was 80, 85. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, that gets us into this conversation that you originally asked about with the fear of success. See, if you have to be stronger, smarter, or somehow better than, that can be very scary with regard to success. So if your father, for instance, told you that, uh, rich people are jerks, then on a subconscious level, that would mean that in order to be rich and successful, you have to be a jerk. That meaning would make it difficult to follow through with behaviors that are designed to get successful themselves. So another uh, sub subconscious frightening obstacle is that when you grow up and evolve and create another expression of yourself, you leave behind other aspects of you, which can represent inner conflicts. So, for instance, I know you guys, we're probably somewhere in the same age range, you remember Jack and Jill when we were kids? Of course. Now, that was great when we were a child, but, you know, our sensitivities and sensibilities change when we grow, so we probably wouldn't get I would imagine you probably wouldn't get the same satisfaction of reading Jack and Jill now as you would then. So that we have outgrown, and, and as we become successful, we do outgrow some of the other uh, things that we used to love, so, we, so those have to be left behind. And as, as you... Uh, well, also, with regard to uh, subconsciously, we consider the idea that, may, that we would have unconscious doubt about, have I done the right thing once we get that? Or will this success make me somehow who I don't want to be? Now, success can also be scary due to the level of complexity and potential turmoil that it can bring. For instance, um, you may be programmed to suppose that there should be no chaos when you have success. There should be no problem. Ah, it's like the story yeah. about the, the guy that was trying to get the answers to his, his problems. And so he climbed this mountain, and he finally at the end of the, climbed the, got the top of the mountain, and he's breathing really hard. So he looks over, and he sees this old woman who looks like she's a 1,000 years old sitting in front of this, this uh, lean-to, and she's smoking on this corn cob pipe. And he starts, to, he starts to ask her a question. She puts her hand up. She says, I know why you're here. He 
He says, you do? She says, yeah, you, you have 99 uh, problems. He says, yeah, how did you do it? She said, well, that's not, that's not the issue. The issue is that your, your main problem is thinking that you shouldn't have 99 problems. So people get caught up in this thing that they shouldn't. Once, once they have success, all want to be beautiful and wonderful. So this, this aspect of, of complexity is something that scares them on a subconscious level, leading limiting, limiting beliefs such as, well, I can never be happy with success, or success is too chaotic for me. So the unconscious thoughts that stem from part of the childhood programming that seeks to stabilize this, this chaos through black and white thinking that is in either way or, or in some way that makes it difficult to see elements of the confluence of the greatest in life. So the point is, is that, you know, this, this black and white way of looking at things does not lead to supporting them in being able to do the things that they want to do and be successful. It actually deters from it. Man, oh, man, Woody, you are on fire more than you know. I just wrote an article that was being published uh, on fear and anxiety, and the thing that you just talked about, the chaos, uh, I couldn't believe when you mentioned chaos in that way because I was writing about it from the standpoint of the still point and how the chaotic attractor and trance and still point all the same thing, and then... This is so exciting, the way that you are able to describe this in a concrete way that the average person could really get it, that why, you know, because you're talking about unconscious fears, you know, we can't see these things. Mm -hmm. So how do we know they're real? Well, we know they're real because, like, you're frozen, that's why you're not moving, or you're going backwards, or you're not doing something, and you don't know why. And so this is very helpful, the way you've explained it. Exactly. In fact, you know what, let's... It, it, it might be helpful for me to share a couple of things to, in, in order to deal with that fear. For instance, um, you want to ask yourself questions like, what's going to happen if I succeed? So this question has a few uh, opportunities to, and even though it may seem kind of obvious, but it begins to garner an unconscious search for what that really means to you, because what you want to do is identify the limiting, irrational, and or negative beliefs that are, that are causing the fear because, you know, any result that you get is an outgrowth of three variables, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, so that the thoughts are going to determine the behavior, the, the emotions, and the emotions are going to drive the behaviors. And, what, and part of the thought process is what we believe. Our beliefs, our biases, our values, all those types of things go into those thoughts. So we, um, if we ask ourselves that, and we, we may have some secondary questions like, well, what will change in my life? And if uh, you take time to allow the question to seep into the lower levels of your awareness, your, un, your subconscious is going to answer the question. For instance, here's, here's some of the limiting beliefs that, that might be associated with the fear of success. That you don't deserve to succeed. That's a limiting belief. Or that you will accomplish all that you set out to, but then you still won't be content, or satisfied, or happy once, you, once you've gotten it. Or the belief that there are others who can take you the way. So there are a lot of things that really, on very unconscious levels, can start this sabotage process to take you out of the success mode and keep you uh, languishing in this coulda, woulda, shoulda play. Thank you, Woody. This is extraordinary. Audience, we'll be back in a moment to continue our conversation with Dr. Woody Johnson on how to eliminate the fear of success, resistance, and self-sabotage. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Wright, Jr., the Stress Relief Doctor, co-host of the Learn to Live Stress-Free podcast series. I'm an author, speaker, and stress management wellness coach. My published study is the first to show the connection between stress reduction, grief recovery, nitric oxide spiking, and the relaxation response. And my practical application of this knowledge helps you relieve the stresses of everyday life. I have the tools to dissolve your pain points quickly and effectively. Email me to find out how you can start to feel better now at stressfreenow.info forward slash contact. That's stressfreenow.info forward slash contact. 
Have you been procrastinating about completing an important project or pursuing a treasured dream? Christine Wright specializes in helping her coaching clients to lay out clear, elegant strategies. She shows you how to quickly build your confidence to uncover and eliminate your habitual patterns of resistance and self-sabotage. Christine helps you discover those meaningful insights that will get you to do what works so you can celebrate your successes. Go to stressfreenow.info forward slash contact to let Christine know that that you're ready to live your ideal life now. Again, that's stressfreenow.info forward slash contact. Welcome. We're back on Learn to Live Stress-Free with Dr. Woody Johnson. Woody, I just have to say I've been listening in, and everything that you're saying is so spectacularly keen and insightful. When you mention that survival mode thinking, And your explanation of it, I think, was just so clear. I know it was helpful to me, and I'm sure it's helpful to our listeners. I could really feel that, the sense of it is a threat to my identity, if. And as you spoke about limiting beliefs, I'm very curious, you know, your thoughts on this, that as you mentioned, you know, it's our thoughts and our emotions and our behaviors, that even when we know something, our feeling can just take us down a wrong path, and when we lose that job, we're not worth anything because that job was us. You know, when this doesn't happen, what would happen if I succeed? I would have what I want, and then what? That the emotional hold of the idea, that even with the information, that that really seems to be where your strong skill set comes in. Could you speak a little bit about, you know, how do you get that aspect of yourself out of the way? Well, great question, Christine. Uh, first of all, th- there's so many ways to do this, but I would encourage anybody that wants to begin process of growth-oriented thinking and living, and, the, and, the, and the, as you just put it, to get out of their way. But first of all, to endeavor to be in the now, right now, in the moment, for the moment, fully available, fully present, and in the now of what's going on. Because people are often inundated by what, Prevention about what just happened or worried about what might happen. And that necessarily reduces your attention to the task at hand. We've only got 100% attention. And if 20% is taken up by convention about what just happened, and then another 10 or 15 or 20% is is taken up by worried about what might happen, that doesn't leave uh, uh, quite a bit to, to work with. And the thing is, there's so many things going on out here that can, can, can really throw a monkey wrench in the thing. We need 100% attention, especially with regard to something like trading. You know, you, you have to, you know, when you're in a trade of trenches, you've got to have all of your, your cylinders firing. So I would encourage them to be, in, to do things that help them to be in the now of what they're doing. Secondly, I would encourage them to be self aware, not self absorbed. That's an ego function, but self-aware, meaning that, that they are monitoring what's going on with their life and monitoring what's going on in the moment. They are trying, to, they are aiming to be on task, on top, and on purpose for what's going on in their trade, if they're trading or in any other aspect of their life. Thirdly, you, I would, to get out of your own way, you, you, you don't want to start to beat yourself up. You don't want to start to self-flagellate, curse yourself. Because, and I used to do that. Years ago, I catch myself talking, you know, I curse myself out. I say, oh, you dummy, you idiot. Why did you do that? You blah, blah, You know, and, you, and it's, all, it's all self-hate based. And if you talk to somebody else like that, you'd be ready for a fight. But then we talk to ourselves like that. So we have to begin to a process of appreciative inquiry, you know, gentle questions that are designed to help us get the data, the information that's in the subconscious. And because, you know, when you think about it, 95%, give or take percentage or so, of everything that goes on in our brain and in our mind is out of our awareness, out of our awareness. So there's a lot of stuff. Even after we have unconscious conversations, internal dialogue that are going on that we're not aware of. So we have to root those out. We root those out through appreciative inquiry, introspection, self-reflection. And then there are, well, like I just like to share with my students about seven steps to really getting yourself in a position to grow and to thrive. First of all, you want to have a purpose. You know, you, you want to identify what your macro purpose is and then 
for each goal that you set for yourself, you want to have a micro purpose for that particular goal because that tells you your why. What is your big why of, of what's going on? Because if your why is strong enough, then you can overcome the things that that uh, the trials and tribulations are throwing your way. It reminds me of this um, this woman. Uh, her name is Heather. She is uh, British. Now, she did something that was absolutely remarkable. She took a rowboat. Now, of course, it was a uh, an advanced rowboat. It wasn't like something you rolled down across a, a, a little pond with. This was a state-of-the-art rowboat, but, but, it, but it only was propelled by rowing, and it was for a single person. She rowed across the Atlantic, and she said that when she got in the middle of the ocean and her her palms and her hands were bleeding and cracked and, and in pain, her, her back was racked with pain, she said that she that she was only 28 when she first did this, and she's done it four times since in other, other oceans around the, around the planet. She said that she began, she got energy from her purpose. Her purpose was a big why. It is a compelling reason. It sets the tone and the tenor for what you're doing, and it's like it, it, it propels you like a turbojet towards your goals. So that that purpose is real important. It's very important. In fact, when you connect it, I, I tell my students to connect the what matters most in your life to the what matters most in the trade. So that when you get to that point, that fork in the road, where you're either going to go to the left and crash and burn and, and violate your rules, or you're going to go to the right, keep your A game at the platform, and, you, and trade in your, with your highest and best trader in tow, that, that choice is, is, is supported by having a strong purpose that's attached to your passion. Of course, most people's passion relate to their family, uh, the loved ones, or something else that really, really is important to them. And, of course, once you have your purpose, you want to have a goal, a smart goal, a, a specific, measurable, achievable, results-oriented, and time-bound goal and, and goals. Thirdly, uh, you want to have a sensory-rich vision, which, which really keys into the new linguistic programming aspect of it. And Bob, I'm sure, and Christy as well, I'm sure you appreciate this, that when you have a vision, when you connect with, that imagery, your brain will treat it, especially if you believe it, your brain will treat it as though it's already reality. So you begin to think and do in ways that are promoting the, the achievement of that, of that goal and that purpose. Number four are the things that you really want to do to get out of your own way and support yourself in, in achieving the results that you want in your, either your training or in your life is to identify someone as a role model or a mentor that is, is already, has already achieved that success that you want. And in that way, you are, you are beginning through identifying what they are doing and how they are thinking. It's because the mentor is best. A role model can be anybody, it's living or dead or books or what, otherwise. But if somebody that you can have a relationship with, that would be ideal. Because in that way, you can begin to ask them questions about, you know, what they do, how they think, what, what, what they feel, and imitate their process. And imitating their process, then you begin to, to set the neural pathways in succession and create the neural networks because we know that neurons that fire together, eventually, if you do it enough with, with enough repetition, will wire together so that you are creating the programming in your brain for the success that you want. Now, after the identifying someone, and that's called modeling, by the way, as you, as you well know, I'm sure. So in that modeling process, you are making what they are doing part of who you are. And as you do repeat it more, that process of modeling creates in your personality those tenets that are most important. Then... Uh, you would identify and organize your your daily process and and begin to planning the planning process as well so organization and planning is is the next and this is a sequential process by the way is the next thing in in, in, in the uh, steps so with with number five you want to organize a step by step process of what you need to do and then begin to plan your daily routine. And it's planning. In fact, if you think about it, 
when you want something really badly, what's the first thing you start doing? You start planning. And the way you plan, you ask, how am I going to get it? If you really want something bad enough, you really become hungry for it. You can, you can, you can feel it in your bones. You can taste it in your mouth. You ask yourself the question, how am I going to get this? Even if it's not verbalized or consciously, that's what you're doing. You say, how am I going to get this? That's the planning process. So once you begin the planning, then you go to getting the knowledge to make the game plan work. Getting the knowledge means identifying what you need to know. Because when we first start out, we're starting out in an unconscious, incompetent way. In other words, we don't know what we don't know. And if we don't know what we don't know, it's like when we're five years old, somebody said, well, uh, let's go out for a ride. You say, okay, great. They said, well, what is this? You said, car. Well, you know, you know what a car is. But what if they asked you, well, what's the process of driving to the one? You say, well, uh, I don't know, because you don't know what you don't know. Then as time goes on, when you begin to identify it, you go from what you don't, identifying that's what you don't know, but you still have have to get the knowledge of how to do it, but you've identified at least what you need to learn. And and as we go into someone who is, say, um, eight or nine, you ask them, well, what, do you, how, what is driving? Well, you, you could describe it, but you'd also know that you don't know how to do it. Then thirdly, when you've got somebody who is like 12, 13 years old, uh, they are painfully aware. In fact, they probably, by 14 or 15, they're going to get into a driver's ed course. So they would become consciously competent. Well, in fact, the second stage is consciously incompetent. The third stage is consciously competent, where you've got to think about every little thing. And fourthly, you want to drop it in the unconscious control. So in that process, you would get the knowledge to make the game plan work. And first of all, you've got to identify what you need to know and ask yourself this question. Is this skill necessary for me to get eventually what I want? In this, in this result. And finally, number seven is persistence and perseverance because nothing is that's worthwhile and valuable is gained overnight. You know, in, in fact, it takes hard work. It takes energy. It takes investment of time and effort. And as you go through that process, there, your sensory-rich vision that you created way back in number three of this process that is connecting you know, what matters most in your life to so what matters most in what you are doing, then you have the energy because it is connected to things that you are passionate about. So that's what those, those are the ways that I would uh, really share with someone to support themselves in getting out of their own way, climbing out of the abyss that they may find themselves in, and catapulting themselves into their successful future. All excellent points. Those are really great strategies, Woody. And I think at some um, someplace in there, there's something that all of us can use to make a change in our lives. Woody, as I was listening to you, the, the thought crossed my mind, and you've actually addressed this a little bit, but I, I want to shape this a little more. And speaking about habits, because for traders, habits are key. Being able to know what you're going to do, say what you're going to do, and actually do it. But one of the habits, I think, that contribute to not positive outcomes but that can keep us stuck is when we get tied to a story of our past failures, of, you know, what we can't do and why we can't do it, and we play it over and over and over in our head. Um, Bob and I, in, in past shows, talk of a catastrophic bifurcation point, that moment when, you know, okay, some event happens or something happens and what once was is no more and we go to something new. What is what is that moment, you know, internal, external, working with NLP, when you've, got, you've been doing this habit that's not working for you, you've been telling the story that's not working for you. In, in your experience teaching, working with your traders and students, what is it that snaps people out of or allows them to finally let go of being habituated to a story that doesn't serve? Well, I think pretty uh, the, the essence of it, uh, pretty succinctly, 
is they get sick and tired of being sick and tired of doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different, expecting a different result. Um, they begin to realize because of their pain that they don't want, they're getting to the point where they don't want to experience this pain anymore. So then at that point, they will begin to legitimately and honestly seek out what it's going to take to make the change works, to turn the corner in their lives, to then begin to get the, the results that they want. And it's that pain that, um, that once they identify it and, and, and get comfortable with it. Well, when I say comfortable, what I mean is emotions are organizing principles. Would you agree with that? Emotions are organizing principles. Mm-hmm. And once we begin to pull back the layers of the onion with regard to what's going on with our emotions, we, 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 we have to make our emotions allies. Not just determination, inspiration, and joy, and love, and all those, but fear, worry, doubt, anger, greed, those are the portals that provide the gold, the treasure for mining that will give us the information, the data that we need. Remember I talked a little bit earlier in the conversation about the fact that data is very important. We, you can't change what you can't face, and you can't face what you don't know. So that getting this data is very important. So once they begin to uh, identify, well, once they begin to, to get tired of feeling this pain, then they want to explore it through that appreciative inquiry process that we talked about, the introspection, self-reflection. Yes, yes. And, and ask themselves questions because our unconscious is, is, you know, our brains and minds are absolutely fantastic. They're, 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 in fact, I would, I would submit that they are the most powerful organic machinery in the universe, in our known universe anyway, so that the unconscious has, is its repository of not only the negative programming that we've experienced and that, that causes self-sabotage, but it's also the gateway and the portal to get us out of it, the creativity, the, the intuition, the connecting the dots. And that's why our, our dual brain is so, so powerful, so, so wonderful, because sure, we've got the left side, which is successive in a semispheric style, but the right side is simultaneous in a semispheric style. That's where we get the intuition. So if we ask ourselves the question, you know, what is, once we identify what it is we want to change, we're going to ask, well, what is it that I need to do to get me out of this and begin to, as you ask yourself questions like that, you'll, your unconscious will begin to show you. It may not be in, as, a, as a person speaking to you. It might be, though, but it could, be, it could become a dream. It could come in symbols and, and, and images um, and all the ways that the unconscious expresses itself. Uh, and in doing that, through this appreciative inquiry process, and through introspection and self-reflection, we can begin to first of all, identify what we need to change and then begin to identify the how we need to do it. Great, Woody. Uh, I thank you for that answer, and I know our audience is uh, appreciating uh, the uh, magnificence of of your insights. I want to thank you for being our featured guest today. Oh, is that all? (laughs) (laughs) It's been a a blast. It certainly has been, you know, and we will definitely have you back for more. I know everyone enjoyed, you know, in hearing range, enjoyed listening to you. Woody, could you tell our audience what is the best way that they can reach you should they want to contact you or work with you? Sure. They can reach me at my email address is, well, probably the easiest email is wjohnson at tradingacademy.com. And they can also go to my website and hopefully the glitches that are there right now will uh, will stop, but that's hit the target all one word dot org, and I've got some lessons on there. I've got some articles and things like that, and some some free, a lot of free stuff that people can go to to to, um, to support them. And also, uh, let's see, my email. 
uh, they need to call me. It's, they can call me at 310-892-4427. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, audience, if you'd like to connect with Dr. Woody Johnson, you can check his website, hitthetarget.org. Again, that's hit, H-I-T-T-H-E-T-A-R-G-E-T, hitthetarget.org. You can email him at wjohnson, J-O-H-N-S-O-N, wjohnson, at tradingacademy.com. And you can also give Woody a call at 310-892-4427. Woody, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's been a great pleasure of mine. Thank you so much for having me. Woody, uh, what final thoughts or key idea would you like our audience to take away from today's broadcast? that you have everything that you need inside to do and be exactly the person that you want. You know, Marianne Williamson is a beautiful writer. And Nelson Mandela used something that she wrote in his inaugural speech when he first became president of South Africa. People think that he said this, but actually he attributes, you know, he says he gives full credit to, to Marianne Williamson. She said that our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. And it's my belief that at our core, we are perfect at our core. What makes us flawed is our thinking, our flawed thinking, which begins to create emotions of doubt and worry and fear and anxiety and anger and all those types of things that then drive behaviors that are self-sabotage in nature. So we've got to begin to identify what we're telling ourselves so that we can change those limiting, irrational, and negative beliefs and then begin to garner emotions that are supportive and positive. And then that's going to lead to behaviors that are going to be in our best interest so we begin to get those results that we want. Just fabulous, Woody. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, being our featured guest today, and I want to thank our audience for listening. Wherever you are and whatever time zone you're in right now, we appreciate your presence and trust that you'll benefit in some way from the information delivered during today's show. We welcome and look forward to receiving your comments about our show. Please let us know if there are additional topics you'd like us to cover or a guest you enjoyed whom you'd like us to invite back. Please contact us through our website with your feedback and suggestions. Remember, listeners, if you'd like to experience the same benefits our coaching clients get with us, including learning how to get more results in your day and easy ways to dissolve your chronic pain, stress, and anxiety, then give us a call at 954-900-2179. That's 954-900-2179. For Christine Wright, this is Dr. Robert Wright, Jr., of www.stressfreenow.info. Until next time, be safe and be well. <laughs>